Chapter 1 of Bulldog Drummond. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Bishop. Bulldog Drummond by Sapper. Herman Cyril McNeil. Chapter 1. In which he takes tea at the Carlton and is surprised. 1. Captain Hugh Drummond, DSO, MC, late of His Majesty's Royal Loamshires, was whistling in his morning bath. Being by nature of a cheerful disposition, the symptom did not surprise his servant, late private of the same famous regiment, who was laying breakfast in an adjoining room. After a while the whistling ceased, and the musical gurgle of escaping water announced that the concert was over. It was the signal for James Denny, the square-jawed ex-batman, to disappear into the back regions and get from his wife the kidneys and bacon which that most excellent woman had grilled to a turn. But on this particular morning the invariable routine was broken. James Denny seemed preoccupied, distrait. Once or twice he scratched his head and stared out of the window with a puzzled frown. And each time, after a brief survey of the other side of Half Moon Street, he turned back again to the breakfast table with a grin. "'What you looking for, James Denny?' the irate voice of his wife at the door made him turn round guiltily. "'Them kidneys is ready and waiting these five minutes!' Her eyes fell on the table, and she advanced into the room, wiping her hands on her apron. "'Did you ever see such a bunch of letters?' she said. Forty five, returned her husband grimly. "'And more to come.' He picked up the newspaper lying beside the chair and opened it out. Them's the result of that, he continued cryptically, indicating a paragraph with a square finger and thrusting the paper under his wife's nose. Demobilised officer, she read slowly, finding peace incredibly tedious but welcome diversion, legitimate if possible, but crime if of a comparatively humorous description, no objection. Excitement essential, would be prepared to consider permanent job if suitably impressed by applicant for his services. Reply at once, box X10. She pushed down the paper on a chair and stared first at her husband and then at the rows of letters neatly arranged on the table. I calls it wicked, she announced at length. Fair flying in the face of providence. Crime, Denny, crime. Don't you get having nothing to do with such mad pranks, my man, or you and me will be having words. She shook an admonitory finger at him and retired slowly to the kitchen. In the days of his youth, James Denny had been a bit wild, and there was a look in his eyes this morning, the suspicion of a glint which recalled old memories. A moment or two later, Hugh Drummond came in. Slightly under six feet in height, he was broad in proportion. His best friend would not have called him good-looking, but he was the fortunate possessor of that cheerful type of ugliness which inspires immediate confidence in its owner. His nose had never quite recovered from the final one year in the public school's heavyweights. His mouth was not small. In fact, to be strictly accurate, only his eyes redeemed his face from being what is known in the vernacular as the frozen limit. Deep-set and steady, with eyelashes that many a woman had envied, they showed the man for what he was, a sportsman and a gentleman, and the combination of the two was an unbeatable production. He paused as he got to the table and glanced at the row of letters. His servant, pretending to busy himself at the other end of the room, was watching him surreptitiously and noted the grin which slowly spread over Drummond's face as he picked up two or three and examined the envelopes. "'Who would have thought it, James?' he remarked at length. "'Great Scott! I shall have to get a partner!' With disapproval showing in every line of her face, Mrs. Denny entered the room, carrying the kidneys, and Drummond glanced at her with a smile. "'Good morning, Mrs. Denny,' he said. Wherefore this worried look on your face? Has that reprobate James been misbehaving himself? The worthy woman snorted. He has not, sir, not yet, leastwise. And if so be that he does... Her eyes travelled up and down the back of the hapless Denny, who was quite unnecessarily pulling books off shelves and putting them back again. If so be that he does, she continued grimly, him and me will have words, as I've told him already this morning. She stalked from the room after staring pointedly at the letters in Drummond's hand, and the two men looked at one another. "'It's that there reference to crime, sir. That's torn it,' said Denny in a hoarse whisper. "'Thinks I'm going to lead you astray, does she, James?' Hugh helped himself to bacon, 
My dear fellow, she can think what she likes so long as she continues to grill bacon like this. Your wife is a treasure, James, a pearl amongst women, and you can tell her so with my love. He was opening the first envelope, and suddenly he looked up with a twinkle in his eyes. Just to set her mind at rest, he remarked gravely, you might tell her that, as far as I can see at present, I shall only undertake murder in exceptional cases. He propped the letter up against the toast rack and commenced his breakfast. Don't go, James. With a slight frown, he was studying the typewritten sheet. I'm certain to want your advice before long, though not over this one. It does not appeal to me, not at all, to assist Messrs. Jones and Jones, whose business is to advance money on note of hand alone, to obtain fresh clients, is a form of amusement which leaves me cold. The waste paper basket, please, James. Tear the effusion up, and we will pass on to the next. He looked at the mauve envelope doubtfully and examined the postmark. Where is Pudlington, James? And one might almost ask, why is Pudlington? No town has any right to such an offensive name. He glanced through the letter and shook his head. Tush, tush. And the wife of the bank manager, too. The bank manager of Pudlington. James, can you conceive of anything so dreadful? But I'm afraid Mrs. Bank Manager is a puss, a distinct puss. It's when they get on the soulmate stunt that the furniture begins to fly. Drummond tore up the letter and dropped the pieces into the basket beside him. He then turned to his servant and handed him the remainder of the envelopes. Go through them, James, while I assault the kidneys, and pick two or three out for me. I see that you will have to become my secretary. No man could tackle that little bunch alone. Do you want me to open them, sir? asked Denny doubtfully. You've hit it, James. Hit it in one. Classify them for me in groups. Criminal, sporting, amatory, that means of or pertaining to love, stupid and merely boring. And as a last resort, miscellaneous. He stirred his coffee thoughtfully. I feel that as a first venture in our new career, ours, I said, James, love appeals to me irresistibly. Find me a damsel in distress, a beautiful girl, helpless in the clutches of knaves. Let me feel that I can fly to her succor, clad in my new grey suiting. He finished the last piece of bacon and pushed away his plate. Amongst all that mass of paper there must surely be one from a lovely maiden, James, at whose disposal I can place my rusty sword. Incidentally, what has become of the damn thing? It's in the lumber room, sir, tied up with the old umbrella and the niblick you don't like. Great heavens, is it? Drummond helped himself to marmalade, and to think that I once pictured myself skewering Huns with it. Do you think anyone would be mug enough to buy it, James? But that worthy was engrossed in a letter he had just opened, and apparently failed to hear the question. A perplexed look was spreading over his face, and suddenly he sucked his teeth loudly. It was a sure sign that James was excited, and though Drummond had almost cured him of this distressing habit, he occasionally forgot himself in moments of stress. His master glanced up quickly and removed the letter from his hands. "'I'm surprised at you, James,' he remarked severely. "'A secretary should control itself.' Don't forget that the perfect secretary is an it, an automatic machine, a thing incapable of feeling. He read the letter through rapidly, and then, turning back to the beginning, he read it slowly through again. My dear Box X-10, I don't know whether your advertisement was a joke. I suppose it must have been, but I read it this morning, and it's just possible, X-10, just possible, that you mean it, and if you do... You're the man I want. I can offer you excitement and probably crime. I'm up against it, X-10. For a girl, I've bitten off rather more than I can chew. I want to help, badly. Will you come to the Carlton for tea tomorrow afternoon? I want to have a look at you and see if I think you are genuine. Wear a white flower in your buttonhole. Drummond laid the letter down and pulled out his cigarette case. Tomorrow, James, he murmured. That is, today, this very afternoon, verily I believe that we have impinged upon the goods. He rose and stood looking out of the window thoughtfully. Go out, my trusty fellow, and buy me a daisy or a cauliflower or something white. You think it's genuine, sir? said James thoughtfully. His master blew out a cloud of smoke. I know it is, he answered dreamily. Look at that writing. The decision in it, the character... She'll be medium height and dark with the sweetest little nose and mouth. Her colouring, James, will be...
but James had discreetly left the room. 2. At four o'clock exactly, Hugh Drummond stepped out of his two-seater at the Haymarket entrance to the Carlton. A white gardenia was in his buttonhole. His grey suit looked the last word in exclusive tailoring. For a few moments after entering the hotel, he stood at the top of the stairs outside the dining room, while his eyes travelled round the tables in the lounge below. A brother officer, evidently taking two country cousins round London, nodded resignedly. A woman at whose house he had danced several times smiled at him, but save for a courteous bow he took no notice. Slowly and thoroughly he continued his search. It was early, of course, yet, and she might not have arrived, but he was taking no chances. Suddenly his eyes ceased wandering and remained fixed on a table at the far end of the lounge. Half hidden behind a plant, a girl was seated alone, and for a moment she looked straight at him. Then, with the faintest suspicion of a smile, she turned away and commenced drumming on the table with her fingers. The table next to her was unoccupied, and Drummond made his way towards it and sat down. It was characteristic of the man that he did not hesitate. Having once made up his mind to go through with a thing, he was in the habit of going and looking neither to the right hand nor to the left, which, incidentally, was how he got his DSO, but that, as Kipling would say, is another story. He felt not the slightest doubt in his mind that this was the girl who had written to him, and, having given an order to the waiter, he started to study her face as unobtrusively as possible. He could only see the profile, but that was quite sufficient to make him bless the moment when more as a jest than anything else he had sent his advertisement to the paper. Her eyes, he could see, were very blue, and great masses of golden brown hair coiled over her ears from under a small black hat. He glanced at her feet. Being an old stager, she was perfectly shod. He glanced at her hands and noted, with approval, the absence of any ring. Then he looked once more at her face and found her eyes fixed on him. This time she did not look away. She seemed to think that it was her turn to conduct the examination, and Drummond turned to his tea while the scrutiny continued. He poured himself out a cup and then fumbled in his waistcoat pocket. After a moment he found what he wanted, and taking out a card he propped it against the teapot so that the girl could see what was on it. In large black capitals he had written Box X-10. Then he added milk and sugar and waited. She spoke almost at once. You'll do, X-10, she said, and he turned to her with a smile. It's very nice of you to say so, he murmured. If I may, I will return the compliment. So will you. She frowned slightly. This isn't foolishness, you know. What I said in my letter is literally true. Which makes the compliment even more returnable, he answered. If I am to embark on a life of crime, I would sooner collaborate with you than, shall we say... That earnest eater over there with the tomato in her hat. He waved vaguely at the lady in question and then held out his cigarette case to the girl. Turkish on this side, Virginia on that, he remarked. And as I appear satisfactory, will you tell me who I'm to murder? With the unlighted cigarette held in her fingers, she stared at him gravely. I want you to tell me, she said at length, and there was no trace of jesting in her voice. Tell me, on your word of honour, whether that advertisement was bona fide or a joke. He answered her in the same vein. It started more or less as a joke. It may now be regarded as absolutely genuine. She nodded as if satisfied. Are you prepared to risk your life? Drummond's eyebrows went up and then he smiled. Granted that the inducement is sufficient, he returned slowly, I think that I may say that I am. She nodded again. You won't be asked to do it in order to obtain a halfpenny bun, she remarked. If you've a match, I would rather like a light. Drummond apologized. I'll talk on trivialities engross me for the moment, he murmured. He held the lighted match for her, and as he did so, he saw that she was staring over his shoulder at someone behind his back. Don't look round, she ordered, and tell me your name, quickly. Drummond, Captain Drummond, late of the Loamshires. He leaned back in his chair and lit a cigarette himself. And are you going to Henley this year? Her voice was a shade louder than before. I don't know, he answered casually. I may run down for a day, possibly, but... My dear Phyllis, said a voice behind his back, this is a pleasant surprise. I had no idea that you were in London. A tall, clean-shaven man stopped beside the table, throwing a keen glance at Drummond. The world is full of such surprises, isn't it? answered the girl lightly. I don't suppose you know Captain Drummond, do you? Mr. Lakington, 
art connoisseur and a、uh, collector. The two men bowed slightly, and Mr. Lakington smiled. I do not remember ever having heard my harmless pastimes more concisely described. He remarked suavely, "Are you interested in such matters?" "Not very, I'm afraid," answered Drummond. "Just recently, I have been rather too busy to pay much attention to art." The other man smiled again, and it struck Hugh that rarely, if ever, had he seen such a cold, merciless face. "Of course, you've been in France," Lakington murmured. "Unfortunately, a bad heart kept me on this side of the water. One regrets it in many ways. Regrets it immensely." Sometimes I cannot help thinking how wonderful it must have been to be able to kill without fear of consequences. There is art in killing, Captain Drummond, profound art. And as you know, Phyllis, he turned to the girl. I have always been greatly attracted by anything requiring the artistic touch. He looked at his watch and sighed. Alas, I must tear myself away. Are you returning home this evening? The girl, who had been glancing round the restaurant, shrugged her shoulders. Probably. She answered, "I haven't quite decided. I might stop with Aunt Kate." Fortunate Aunt Kate. With a bow, Lakington turned away, and through the glass, Drummond watched him get his hat and stick from the cloakroom. Then he looked at the girl and noticed that she had gone a little white. "What's the matter, old thing?" he asked quickly. "Are you feeling faint?" She shook her head, and gradually the colour came back to her face. "I'm quite all right," she answered. "It gave me rather a shock that man finding us here." On the face of it, it seems a harmless occupation," said Hugh. "On the face of it, perhaps," she said. "But that man doesn't deal with face values." With a short laugh, she turned to Hugh. "You stumbled right into the middle of it, my friend. Rather sooner than I anticipated. That is one of the men you will probably have to kill." Her companion lit another cigarette. "There is nothing like straightforward candour." He grinned. Except that I disliked his face and his manner, I must admit that I saw nothing about him to necessitate my going to so much trouble. What is his particular worry? First and foremost, the brute wants to marry me," replied the girl. "I loathe being obvious," said Hugh. "But I am not surprised." "But it isn't that that matters," she went on. "I wouldn't marry him even to save my life." She looked at Drummond quietly. Henry Lakington is the second most dangerous man in England. Only second," murmured Hugh. "Then hadn't I better start my new career with the first?" She looked at him in silence. "I suppose you think that I'm hysterical," she remarked after a while. "You're probably even wondering whether I'm all there." Drummond flicked the ash from his cigarette. Then he turned to her dispassionately. "You must admit." He remarked that up to now our conversation has hardly proceeded along conventional lines. I am a complete stranger to you. Another man who is a complete stranger to me speaks to you while we're at tea. You inform me that I shall probably have to kill him in the near future. The statement is, I think you will agree, a trifle disconcerting. The girl threw back her head and laughed merrily. "You poor young man!" she cried. "Put that way, it does sound alarming." Then she grew serious again. There's plenty of time for you to back out now, if you like. Just call the waiter and ask for my bill. We'll say goodbye, and the incident will finish. She was looking at him gravely as she spoke, and it seemed to her companion that there was an appeal in the big blue eyes, and they were very big, and the face they were set in was very charming, especially at the angle it was tilted at in the half light of the room. Altogether, Drummond reflected, a most adorable girl, and adorable girls had always been a hobby of his. Probably Lakington possessed a letter of hers or something, and she wanted him to get it back. Of course he would, even if he had to thrash the swine within an inch of his life. Well, the girl's voice cut into his train of thought, and he hurriedly pulled himself together. The last thing I want is for the incident to finish, he said fervently. Why, it's only just begun. Then you'll help me. That's what I'm here for. With a smile, Drummond lit another cigarette. Tell me all about it. The trouble, she began after a moment, is that there is not very much to tell. At present, it is largely guesswork and guesswork without much of a clue. However, to start with, I had better tell you what sort of men you are up against. First, Henry Lakington, the man who spoke to me. He was, I believe, one of the most brilliant scientists who have ever been up at Oxford. 
There was nothing in his own line which would not have been open to him had he run straight. But he didn't. He deliberately chose to turn his brain to crime. Not vulgar, common sorts of crime, but the big things, calling for a master criminal. He has always had enough money to allow him to take his time over any coup, to perfect his details. And that's what he loves. He regards crime as an ordinary man regards a complicated business deal, a thing to be looked at and studied from all angles, a thing to be treated as a mathematical problem. He is quite unscrupulous. He is only concerned in pitting himself against the world and winning. An engaging fella, said Hugh. What particular form of crime does he favour? Anything that calls for brain, iron nerve and refinement of detail, she answered. Principally, up to date, burglary on a big scale, and murder. My dear soul, said Hugh incredulously, how can you be sure? And why don't you tell the police? She smiled wearily. Because I've got no proof, and even if I had, she gave a little shudder and left her sentence unfinished. But one day my father and I were in his house, and, by accident, I got into a room I'd never been in before. It was a strange room, with two large safes let into the wall and steel bars over the skylight in the ceiling. There wasn't a window, and the floor seemed to be made of concrete, and the door was covered with curtains, and was heavy to move, almost as if it was steel or iron. On the desk in the middle of the room lay some miniatures, and, without thinking, I picked them up and looked at them. I happened to know something about miniatures, and, to my horror, I recognized them. She paused for a moment as a waiter went by their table. Do you remember the theft of the celebrated Vatican miniatures belonging to the Duke of Melbourne? Drummond nodded. He was beginning to feel interested. They were the ones I was holding in my hand, she said quietly. I knew them at once from the description in the papers. And just as I was wondering what on earth to do, the man himself walked into the room. Awkward. Deuced awkward. Drummond pressed out his cigarette and leaned forward expectantly. What did he do? Absolutely nothing, said the girl. That's what made it so awful. Admiring my treasures, he remarked. Pretty things, aren't they? I couldn't speak a word. I just put them back on the table. Wonderful copies, he went on, of the Duke of Melbourne's lost miniatures. I think they would deceive most people. They deceived me, I managed to get out. Did they, he said. The man who painted them will be flattered. All the time he was staring at me, a cold, merciless stare that seemed to freeze my brain. Then he went over to one of the safes and unlocked it. Come here, Miss Benton, he said. There are a lot more. Copies. I looked inside only for a moment, but I have never seen or thought of such a sight. Beautifully arranged on black velvet shelves were ropes of pearls, a gorgeous diamond tiara, and a whole heap of loose uncut stones. And in one corner I caught a glimpse of the most wonderful gold chalked cup, just like the one for which Samuel Levy, the Jew moneylender, was still offering a reward. Then he shut the door and locked it, and again stared at me in silence. All copies, he said quietly, wonderful copies, and should you ever be tempted to think otherwise, ask your father, Miss Benton. Be warned by me, don't do anything foolish, ask your father first. And did you? asked Drummond. She shuddered. That very evening, she answered, and Daddy flew into a frightful passion, and told me never to dare meddle in things that didn't concern me again. Then, gradually, as time went on, I realized that Lakington had some hold over Daddy, that he'd got my father in his power. Daddy, of all people, who wouldn't hurt a fly, the best and dearest man who ever breathed. Her hands were clenched, and her breast rose and fell stormily. Drummond waited for her to compose herself before he spoke again. You mentioned murder, too, he remarked. She nodded. I've got no proof, she said, less even than over the burglaries. But there was a man called George Dringer, and one evening, when Lakington was dining with us, I heard him discussing this man with Daddy. He's got to go, said Lakington. He's dangerous. And then my father got up and closed the door, but I heard them arguing for half an hour. Three weeks later, a coroner's jury found that George Dringer had committed suicide while temporarily insane. The same evening, Daddy, for the first time in his life, went to bed the worse for drink. The girl fell silent and Drummond stared at the orchestra with troubled eyes. Things seemed to be rather deeper than he had anticipated. Then there was another case. 
She was speaking again. Do you remember that man who was found dead in a railway carriage at Oxy Station? He was an Italian, Giuseppe by name, and the jury brought in a verdict of death from natural causes. A month before, he had an interview with Lakington which took place at our house. Because the Italian, being a stranger, came to the wrong place, and Lakington happened to be with us at the time. The interview finished with a fearful quarrel. She turned to Drummond with a smile. Not much evidence, is there? Only I know Lakington murdered him. I know it. You may think I'm fanciful, imagining things. You may think I'm exaggerating. I don't mind if you do, because you won't for long. Drummond did not answer immediately. Against his saner judgment he was beginning to be profoundly impressed, and, at the moment, he did not quite know what to say. That the girl herself firmly believed in what she was telling him, he was certain. The point was how much of it was, as she herself expressed it, fanciful imagination. "'What about this other man?' he asked at length. "'I can tell you very little about him,' she answered. "'He came to the Elms.' that is the name of Lakington's house, three months ago. He is about medium height and rather thick set, clean shaven, with thick brown hair flecked slightly with white. His forehead is broad and his eyes are a sort of cold grey blue. But it's his hands that terrify me. They're large and white and utterly ruthless. She turned to him appealingly. Oh, don't think I'm talking wildly, she implored. He frightens me to death, that man far, far worse than Lakington. He would stop at nothing to gain his ends, and even Lakington himself knows that Mr. Peterson is master. Peterson, murmured Drummond, it seems quite a sound old English name. The girl laughed scornfully. Oh, the name is sound enough, if it was his real name. And it is. It's about as real as his daughter. There is a lady in the case, then? By the name of Irma, said the girl briefly. She lies on a sofa in the garden and yawns. She's no more English than that waiter. A faint smile flickered over her companion's face. He had formed a fairly vivid mental picture of Irma. Then he grew serious again. "'And what is it that makes you think there's mischief ahead?' he asked abruptly. The girl shrugged her shoulders. "'What the novelists call feminine intuition, I suppose,' she answered. "'That and my father.' She said the last words very low. "'He hardly ever sleeps at night now. I hear him pacing up and down his room, hour after hour, hour after hour.' Oh, it makes me mad. Don't you understand? I've just got to find out what the trouble is. I've got to get him away from those devils before he breaks down completely. Drummond nodded and looked away. The tears were bright in her eyes, and, like every Englishman, he detested a scene. While she had been speaking, he had made up his mind what course to take, and now, having outsat everybody else, he decided that it was time for the interview to cease. Already an early diner was having a cocktail, while Lakington might return at any moment, and if there was anything in what she had told him, it struck him that it would be as well for that gentleman not to find them still together. I think, he said, we'd better go. My address is 60A Half Moon Street. My telephone is 1234 Mayfair. If anything happens, if ever you want me, at any hour of the day or night, ring me up or write. If I'm not in, leave a message with my servant Denny. He's absolutely reliable. The only other thing is your own address. The larches, near Godalming, answered the girl as they moved towards the door. Oh, if you only knew the glorious relief of feeling one's got someone to turn to. She looked at him with shining eyes, and Drummond felt his pulse quicken suddenly. Imagination or not, so far as her fears were concerned, the girl was one of the loveliest things he had ever seen. May I drop you anywhere? he asked as they stood on the pavement but she shook her head. No, thank you. I'll go in that taxi. She gave the man an address and stepped in, while Hugh stood bareheaded by the door. Don't forget, he said earnestly, any time of the day or night. And while I think of it, we're old friends. Can that be done, in case I come and stay, you see? She thought for a moment, and then nodded her head. All right, she answered. We've met a lot in London during the war. With a grinding of gear wheels, the taxi drove off, leaving Hugh with a vivid picture imprinted on his mind of blue eyes and white teeth and a skin like the bloom of a sun-kissed peach. For a moment or two he stood staring after it, and then he walked across to his own car. With his mind still full of the interview, he drove slowly along Piccadilly, while every now and then he smiled grimly to himself.
Was the whole thing an elaborate hoax? Was the girl even now chuckling to herself at his gullibility? If so, the game had only just begun, and he had no objection to a few more rounds with such an opponent. A mere tea at the Carlton could hardly be the full extent of the jest. And somehow, deep down in his mind, he wondered whether it was a joke, whether, by some freak of fate, he had stumbled on one of those strange mysteries which, up to date, he had regarded as existing only in the realms of shilling shockers. He turned into his rooms and stood in front of the mantelpiece taking off his gloves. It was as he was about to lay them down on the table that an envelope caught his eye, addressed to him in an unknown handwriting. Mechanically, he picked it up and opened it. Inside was a single half-sheet of notepaper on which a few lines had been written in a small, neat hand. There are more things in heaven and earth, young man, than a capability for eating steak and onions and a desire for adventure. I imagine that you possess both, and they are useful assets in the second locality mentioned by the poet. In heaven, however, one never knows, especially with regard to the onions. Be careful. Drummond stood motionless for a moment, with narrowed eyes. Then he leaned forward and pressed the bell. Who bought this note, James? he said quietly as his servant came into the room. A small boy, sir, said I was to be sure and see you got it most particular. He unlocked a cupboard near the window and produced a tantalus. Whiskey, sir, or cocktail? Whiskey, I think, James. Hugh carefully folded the sheet of paper and placed it in his pocket. And his face, as he took the drink from his man, would have left no doubt in an onlooker's mind as to why, in the past, he had earned the name of Bulldog Drummond. End of chapter 1 Recording by Peter Bishop